Okay, so this is part two of the video response to the email I received from the Christian Literalist. <coughs> if you haven't watched the uh, first video yet, then please do. Um, the link is in the description. So, um, I'm going to be addressing in this second half of the video examples of God's unjust behaviour, his unholy behaviour and his malicious behaviour. Um, unjust. The, uh, when I read about this, actually, I remember rec I recalled a story from my rather mild Church of England upbringing, um, and curiously enough, I can't think why, they'd omitted that part that really makes the whole story a key example of unjust behaviour. It's the Exodus story, <coughs> and Pharaoh, after having various plagues and pestilence unleashed upon him by God, finally says, OK, I'm done. You know, I've had enough. You've 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 made your point. I'm going to release the Israelites. I'm going to let you guys go. But this is apparently what God wanted the whole time. He wanted Pharaoh to release the Israelites. But it still wasn't enough for God. Pharaoh's decided to let them go. God says, nah, not yet, not yet. And he hardens Pharaoh's heart. Now this is the bit that I'd missed. I'd been conveniently glossed over when I was a child. They'd sort of made it out that it was Pharaoh who changed his mind again. No, no, God hardens Pharaoh's heart and makes Pharaoh say, no, actually, I'm not going to let you guys go after all. <laughs> Sorry, just kidding. And the only reason God did this was so that he could unleash his final plague, which was the killing of the firstborn children of Egypt. Now, that's pretty unjust in my book, because this was done purely to glorify himself and show how, everyone how powerful he is. You know, so that generations of, to come will, will fear me and you know, blah, blah, blah. In fact, I think, what's the quote? It's right here. And that thou mayest tell in the ears of thy son and of thy son's son what things I have wrought in Egypt and my signs which I have done among them, that ye may know that I am the Lord. So it's done purely to, to glorify himself and make people fear him. Um, I mean, it's very unjust because, well, firstly, you know, Pharaoh didn't change his mind back again. God made him change mind back again and then punished him for it, and didn't even punish Pharaoh, didn't even punish him directly. He killed the firstborn, innocent firstborn children of Egypt. I mean, if God had, be had beef with Pharaoh, why didn't he kill Pharaoh? You know, or give him some kind of horrible disease or something, you know, to make an example. If he wanted to make an example, he could have done it without killing innocent firstborn children. Let's face it. I mean, if God can supposedly do anything, he could have done it without doing that. Um, Especially not as a result of him actually making Pharaoh change his mind back again. You know, and just so that he can use that as an excuse to kill the firstborn children of Egypt. That is very unjust in my book. There's a lot of different ways he could have done it, he chose not to. So, unholy behaviour. This was quite a tough one, actually, because <coughs> it's very difficult to quantify unholy behaviour. It's a very subjective term, very dependent on your own beliefs, your own morals, that sort of thing. But I tried to think about it from a Christian's perspective, seeing as that seemed to be the most fair way to go about it. And blood sacrifice is usually something that Christians accuse um, Satanists or pagans of doing. I mean, I, I know very little about either Satanism or paganism, to be quite honest with you. You know, so I don't really know or care whether they <laughs> whether they partake in blood sacrifice or not. Um, but I, I, I doubt that most of them do. But it, it's something that um, a lot of Christians, fundy Christians in particular, will say this is a very, you know, ritualistic pagan or satanic ritual type thing. So you'd think that God wouldn't actually condone this, but if you look at the first nine chapters of Leviticus, the whole thing pretty much is examples of how to kill and burn animals for God because apparently he likes the smell. Well, this raises two points. Firstly, God obviously enjoys blood sacrifice, which is supposed to be an unholy thing, according to a lot of funny Christians, that a lot of supposedly unholy people are accused of doing. Um, that's the first point. The second point is that the reason that this is done, apparently, is because God likes the smell. They keep using the phrase, a sweet savour unto the Lord because he obviously likes the smell. He wants you to burn the fat in the entrails and goodness knows what else, because he likes the smell of it. Well, this is going back to the point that I didn't address directly in this person's email, that God doesn't have human emotions. Well, 
this is likes and dislikes. God likes the smell of burning animal flesh. This is a, a like, something that he likes. Now that's an emotional thing, surely, that God likes something. Now if God has likes and dislikes, doesn't that mean he has human emotions? Or at least emotions of some sort? Just a point. Anyway, the main point is that blood sacrifice is something that Christians often say is an unholy practice, something that pa pagans and Satanists are accused of doing. And yet nine chapters of the book of Leviticus are completely devoted to that, and there's plenty after that. Now I'm not going to go into details, but I'll just chuck out a few at you so you get the idea. Um, flay the burnt offering, cut it into pieces, Leviticus 1.6. Burn the head, fat and entrails for a sweet savour unto the Lord. That's Leviticus 1 verses 8 to 9. Uh, the priest shall dip his finger in the blood and sprinkle the blood seven times before the Lord. Um, it's 4, 6, I believe. Kill the bullock before the Lord and take of the bullock's blood. That's Leviticus 4, 4. That means they actually want you to drink the bullock's blood. Lovely. Um, and it goes on and on and on. I'm not going to read the whole thing because it'll take me all day. I'm going to put these in the uh, description so that you can read them for yourself if you want to. But don't show it to your kids. It's pretty graphic. Finally, um, examples of malice. Well, this may be a slightly more subjective term, but I think that the flood was pretty malicious. Um, if God was unhappy with the way the world turned out, why couldn't he just snap his fingers and wipe everybody off the face of existence? I mean, a flood, that's comparatively slow. The waters would have risen and people would have been running from them, terrified. Um, to get to higher ground with the waters chasing them. Um, you know, when they finally got there and they realised that the waters were creeping up and there was no escape, they'd have been screaming and crying and wailing because they know they're going to die. And then when the water eventually catches up with them, they'll be floundering about for quite a considerable amount of time, I should imagine, until they finally drown from exhaustion. Now that's pretty... <laughs> that's pretty horrible, really, when you consider that God is supposedly all-powerful and could have just, you know zipped everybody out of existence and even if people were the problem even if humans were the problem why did children warrant this death or babies even ones that hadn't even sinned yet i mean it just it seems so unnecessary um and not only that but animals okay you know obviously a lot of the animals supposedly two of every animal were in the ark but the ones that um, weren't in the ark, they all suffered and died. You know, he saved two of every kind to repopulate, but why did he need to do that? Why did? Why couldn't he have just snapped the people out of existence and the animals could have all stayed intact? Doesn't make any sense whatsoever. So, yeah, don't understand that one at all. Don't understand why the flood was necessary. Um, and of course, I mean, all this is hypothetical. I just want to reiter reiterate this point. Um, I'm trying to counter the points of a Christian that the Bible is inerrant and God in the Bible does not exhibit certain characteristics. I don't believe in the I, I don't believe that the Bible is the word, word of God and I don't believe in God or gods or anything. So this to me is a hypothetical argument. Um, but seeing as he wanted to address those points, seeing as he raised those points, I felt that I should address them on his terms. So that's what I've done. <coughs> anyway, do let me know what you think. I'd like to hear your opinions. Um, and you know post things in the comments post video responses whatever you want to do um it'd be good to hear from you in the meantime take care and i'll see you soon bye